Hi, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. It's one of those words they don't translate correctly. It's in this New Testament, which I don't take too seriously. I mean, Jesus Christ and was a pretty good Buddha, and um, so there it is, the karagma. It, um, in the unabridged Greek-English lexicon, you can see that it means the impress on the coin or stamp money coin. So it's really the money of the beast. And they don't tell you that. There's, you know, there's a lot of things in this New Testament that, like St. Paul, is the problem. And this guy, um, Thomas Jefferson, edited the New Testament and ripped out all this stuff from St. Paul. And they don't, you know, this gospel of the, the apocalypse at the very end of the New Testament is kind of strange because only at the very beginning and end does it ever mention Jesus, which, um, you know, I think originally it was a Hebrew book. It was written for the Jews, uh, kind of in a Jewish apocrypha. And uh, and then, um, they, you know, it has to do with Nero. Nero was the emperor about the time that Jesus lived. And um, so if you take the letters of Nero's name and transliterate those into Greek letters where A equals 1 or B beta equals 2, then it spells Nero. And I made a little explanation of that. It's, uh, uh, you know, I don't take this New Testament too seriously, but, you know, Jesus Christ believed in eliminating money, and they don't really tell you that in the... Uh, you know, if you go to church or something, it's mostly the St. Paul stuff. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, you're going to be saved. So it's like almost Christmas time. Today is December 12th. So we're going to... One of my most popular photographs, I think it got like 33 views, <clears throat> is Raquel's Christmas sermon, which has to do with Another one of these words they don't really translate correctly is like in the beginning was the word <clears throat> and the word was God, but they don't translate that. You see the logos, John 1.1, 1, 1, but it um, really means, uh, it rarely means the word. <clears throat> it means reason and uh, logos, see logos, reasoning. And so, like, if it's not logical, then it's not of God. And the devil the, is a slanderer because, like, you know, the etymology of the word devil, it means to slander and, uh, and falsely accuse. So a lot of these people who um, believed in eliminating money, you know, like I was telling you, Jesus Christ was one of them who uh, believed in eliminating money. And uh, he said, you can't serve God or money. You'll either love the one or hate the other or hold to the one or despise the other. But the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed, and that's in Luke. So Jesus was really a communist. In fact, the Essenes, who were contemporaries of Jesus, if he existed, you know, if, if, you know, if Jesus existed, he certainly didn't walk on water. But, you know, he could have been a guru, or he could have been a cult, or or um, a philosophy of the time. Uh, like in India, the gurus are the rock stars of the nation. And so Jesus, you know, in being living in that kind of um, Middle Eastern um, orientation, especially like around the time of um, Caesar and um, Nero and all this rabble-rousing. In fact, the Jews revolted against Rome in, uh, what was it, 60 A.D.? I've got it on my little pamphlet here, 60. I know in 66 they were during the revolt because, you know, that's like 666, and so I remember those kind of things. So, like, Nero was the emperor when this, you know, um, revelation was written. <clears throat> and um, if you transliterate the numbers of his name, it, it comes to uh, Nero Caesar, and um, so that uh, the Jews started coining their own money, and um, it was called like the first re revolt coinage, and um, and that was like a direct violation of Roman law to start coining your own money. 
which um, I kind of think, you know, it's like if, if, you know, these people, some people still think if we had a gold exchange that, you know, the whole world would be wonderful and saved, you know, and, uh, and instead we got this fiat money, the so-called Federal Reserve notes that, um, that, you know, there's all these dumb conspiracies about. And like with gold, though, it's like, you know, the biggest problem they had in Roman times was people counterfeiting it. And they, I think, like, very near the end of the, th these civilizations, the ratio of gold to brass or whatever they melt it with is, like, really low. And so that's the way they did inflation in the old days, is they just melted the gold and, and then um, added some brass or whatever they did. And and then I put a new stamp on it. And that's actually what this karagma word means. It's like the impress on the coin. And uh, so no one buys or sells without this karagma and uh, the impress on the coin. And Plutarch lived around the time that all this stuff happened. And Antipater Thessalonius, the first century before Christ. and. Um, Antipater and Plutarch and was contemporary, and and he said it was the impress on the coin. So, like you know, they don't translate these words correctly. Like the word mammon, uh, you know, the, some Bibles say that Jesus said you can't serve God or mammon, and then they deceive you and making you think that mammon is some kind of golem or something. But mammon is really an Aramaic word for money. And uh, I think the, the new Oxford English translation of, um, of the Gospels uh, say that it's money. There. And I've been editing the Wikipedia uh, and trying you know, keep it current so that last time I checked it, if you look up the definition of mammon on Wikipedia, you'll see that it means money. And same with the, mar the mark of the beast it'll redirect you to the number of the beast and you can read what I've just told you but they put it way down there like um, in various interpretations of it you know I wish they'd put I should put it up there you know there, there's no real well it's the number of the beast so you can't really say it's the mark of the beast and it's that word mark that they mistranslate it's the money of the beast and I already showed you this over here, how it is, the the money. It's it's uh, kragma is is the um, <clears throat> Greek um, word for the impress on the coin or stamp money coin. So anyway, it's been so crazy, you know, this news and everything. The, um, you know, the big story is these black men or boys that were disrespectful to the police officers and got shot, um, you know, I mean, like, these police officers are risking their lives and, um, you know, going out there and, you know, this guy just ripped off a bunch of cigarillos from um, the grocery store and it was being belligerent. And the other one, you know, he wasn't, he was making money illegally selling cigarettes on the street, you know, and he was fooling around and you know, just, I, I, you know, I mean, was that wasn't really a chokehold. It was uh, an, an arm lock, uh, you know, it wasn't really a, but like, you know, these cops are out there risking their lives, you know, and um, this guy, Eric, uh, whatever the guy was in uh, Missouri there, he's going to have to hide out for the rest of his life or go to somewhere in Idaho or something, you know. And, you know, he really, you know, my cousin, She's a she's a cop up in uh, Tacoma, and ended up shooting somebody. And I was reading that like most cops that shoot somebody, end up retiring after seven years. And I was hiking up at uh, Sabino Canyon once, and my dad uh, and this woman were getting together talking, and we found out that she her husband is a detective here in Tucson. He's been a detective for at least almost 30 years, whatever the, the retirement age was, and he was about to retire, and she was telling us that uh, 
he was about to retire and and uh, how uh, much stress it is, you know, being a police officer. And he's so glad to finally be able to retire because, you know, it's you've seen these shows, uh, Cops on uh, Channel 11 here, Fox, um, whatever that is. And, you know, the, these cops have to deal with such crazy people, you know. And, and you know, I one time got choked by a cop and the cop said to me, I'm going to kill you. And, you know, I was just reading at the University of Arizona. I was in the library, and um, the police here at the University of Arizona didn't like me. I was homeless, and I had my backpack in there, and I was reading books. You know, I was reading books on the Kennedy assassination and um, Pol Pot. I was reading about uh, what really happened in Cambodia. You know, Nixon illegally bombed Cambodia because they were running, it's like a shortcut to South Vietnam, and so we carpet bombed that whole area, and almost half of um, uh, Cambodia was bombed by the United States. And so, you, you know, they slandered Pol Pot. He was another one of these guys who believed in eliminating money. And Muammar Gaddafi, the populist leader of Libya, believed in eliminating money. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I used to go to the University of Arizona and I'd pass out these little flyers, <clears throat> and the police didn't like me, they, uh, because I talked a lot about, well, I talked about the Kennedy assassination and and um, eliminating money, and and then I also found out about this um, this uh, Holocaust. You know, the, you know, I never, I was doing research about people who believed in eliminating money, and. Um, Somehow or other, I don't remember how. Well, I think I could have been because <clears throat> I found out that that this guy, Rudolf Hess, who was Hitler's deputy, was like his vice president. You know, they were really close. And um, for his deputy took an aircraft and started flying. And then he vanished. And then some guy, an imposter, landed in Scotland and uh, claimed to be Rudolf Hess. And he didn't really exactly look exact. He didn't look at all like the real Rudolf Hess. If you get a picture of, of both of them together, I think I might have that here. Because I wrote this story a long time ago, back in, uh, no, it's not in this issue. This is the issue I wrote about the Kennedy assassination. I used to write for... Ed Finkelstein, I, don't, I think he ran for mayor once here, and so I got the front page story on the Arizona Examiner, and I think Finkelstein sold the rights to that name to somebody, uh, a Tucson Examiner, that's what it is. And um, so I wrote this story about Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, and uh, if you look at, there's a book called... Uh, the assassination of Rudolf Hess, and this guy Hugh Thomas, who was the British doctor during the incarceration of Hess and Spandau, and this doctor did an examination on the prisoner number six, and found out that there was no evidence of any bullet wound. You know, if the real Rudolf Hess got shot in the chest in World War One, and and would have had a, a bullet wound. And um, I don't know why the British doctor suspected that there was something funny. I mean, it's, actually, it was kind of obvious, because if you look at the videotapes of the Nuremberg trials, where Rudolf Hess was on the docket, along with Hermann Goring and uh, a few others, and, um, of course, Hermann Goring committed suicide before they could hang him. He ate a cyanide pill. And Goring was always laughing at uh, Hess, this Hess in quotation marks, because uh, he didn't really look alike. So that that was kind of like the first, I don't know, so I was doing research on World War II also, and I happened to read in one of these volumes of the war crimes trials, they have like three different sets, they had like these blue volumes and red volumes and green volumes, and I think it was in the red volumes where they did um, they did they did so-called like uh, 
confessions and uh, testimony of some of these people. And one of these, I'm pretty sure, I, I don't, it was, I don't remember if it was testimony, but they said that like when the, when these, after the Jews were gassed, the, the Nazis would like cut their bellies open and it was like, they, they actually, the guy actually said, gold to the left, gold to the right. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, this sounds like, I, don't, I just can't believe that, you know, this is really happening kind of a thing, you know, because first of all, what would these people be doing having gold in these concentration camps? And then also, you know, it's kind of grotesque. I mean, I don't know, like, um, it, it's just, well, I, later I found out that, that it's not practical to exterminate people with louse disinfestant the way they said they did. And um, and diesel exhaust is not a very and like they say they use diesel exhaust at Treblinka, and then they use this last disinfestant at Auschwitz, and it's like the so-called confessions were that they would dump this stuff through holes in the chimney and then sweep it out the windows. There was a woman, Valerie Kutner or something or other, and she testified in the the blue volumes about. Um, sweeping this stuff out the windows. Where do I... I got it on one of these papers I wrote here. Miss Valerie Coutier. What the heck, where is it? But, uh, yeah, so, the, you know, logistically, it's just, um, you know, hard to dispose of all these dead people, too. and Because it takes, like, an hour to cremate a body. Here it is. And um, it takes a lot of fuel, too. And they've had aerial reconnaissance of these of the Auschwitz concentration camp because it was a very strategic bombing thing they did end up bombing it they were making uh, um, you know, artificial rubber what do they call it butylene or butane or something not butane uh, buna buna rubber and so like Auschwitz is a chemical complex and like you know they were converting coal into gas you know, it was RGA Farben and uh, chemical company, and so um, they you know, had a lot of people in these um, concentration camps, and they had to fumigate the clothes, and they had these special chambers where they hung the clothes up, and and they'd put this Zyklon B hydrogen cyanide into these little um, vestibules, and they'd close the door and. They had a special crank. You know, I used to work in a bakery, and they had those number 10, ten tins there, and they used to have a bench can opener. It was like you put the can on the bench, and then you slide this thing down on top of it, and it's got a big crank, and it cranks open the, the lid on it. So these, these Zyklon B disinfestant chambers had these little apparatus for dispensing the gas out of these cans and I'm sure they had some kind of a can opener like that so after you close the door of this airtight container um, you could open the can and then flip the lid off somehow and that's the way these things worked and they've got diagrams of it they I forget the name of the company DG Tech or something that made these gas chambers you know like during uh World War One, they had like three million civilians in Soviet Union die from typhus, and I was reading one of these books that you know when they these people these refugees and things are being moved around, they had to be careful not to have a typhus epidemic, and like at Auschwitz where they had sixty thousand people, uh, and they were going to have more, and then they um, they um, occasionally had typhus epidemics and this guy Mengele would sit on the um, uh, platform, the railroad platform and, and, and see if anybody looked like they were sick and if they were sick they would be directed into the area where they would be disinfested and they'd have to take off their clothes and the women had their hair shaved and um, they had all their clothes taken away and put inside these fumigation chambers where they had airtight doors and these little vestibules where they put the Zyklon B and they had this crank to open the can and then they would heat, heat it up a little bit and they had a fan in there and the fan would blow this poison into the fumigation chamber 
and it would kill the lice. And then after an hour or so, and uh, they would uh, um, ventilate the gas through a chimney uh, up into the air and then um, remove the clothes. But um, they never had any kind of apparatus inside these so-called death chambers where they would kill like 2,000 people at a time. And um, so like uh, they said the alleged confessions like this, Valerie Kootner here is saying that they just um, swept this stuff out the, the door, you know, and, uh, and then they asked her where she heard about this, and she says that um, somebody told her about it, you know. They, had, they have what they call <clears throat> black propaganda, and um, so, like, it, uh, it's not practical to kill people with a louse disinfestant, you know. You wonder why would the Nazis waste all this energy transporting people from here to there? Why wouldn't they just take these railroad cars and back them into a, a tunnel and close the tunnel off and let the coal-fired fumes from the locomotive um, asphyxiate everybody? And, um, and then from there they could transport them and use conveyor belts or whatever, you know, and and uh, but they didn't do that, you know. It's like what they really did was they had these transit transit camps, and they'd um, concentrate the people and move them further east. And uh, they wanted Germany always wanted to have um, living space, and they wanted to be uh, Juden free. They, you know, it's like in Europe today, we have a lot of these Muslims. You know, France has. Um, a real hard problem with them, and uh, and uh, you know they're they're fanatic and they're you know religious. You know when I was growing up, we never heard about this. You know, and it wasn't a problem, and and um, you know we we didn't even have a problem with Mexicans. You know, and uh, and or well, you know, I mean we did have some problems with the blacks. You know, especially like in 1968 when they. Uh, killed Martin Luther King, and I'm convinced that, that the FBI did that, you know, before King um, was assassinated, he had a plan to have a march on Washington, a poor people's march or something like that, and, um, you know, like uh, Malcolm X at first, you know, he was against the whitey, and he blamed the whitey for the problems, you know, the slave driver, the cracker and all that, but then Malcolm X wised up and realized that, you know, we're just as big a victims as you are, you know, these plutocrats have taken over the country and Eisenhower warned us about it with this uh, military industrial complex, like Dick Cheney is head of Halliburton and, you know, it's a common cliche that all wars are caused for the sake of getting money. So, you know, I was telling you that I made this, uh, I was doing research on people who believed in eliminating money and I found out that Pol Pot, you know, the populist leader of Libya, um, uh, not Libya, um, Cambodia, was um, uh, believed or in eliminating money. And so, like, everybody who believes in eliminating money gets slandered and demonized by these devils who love money. And, uh, you know, if Jesus was alive today, he would go down there on Wall Street and upset the tables of the money changers who worship money five days a week in these temple towers in Babylon. But, um, you know, I've really liked to see, you know, I maybe now they don't have to worry about this lawsuit. It was like the worst year of my life. And I just found out, like, yesterday that this guy who sued me, he's got a $1.6 million house. That's what he paid for. But, you know, the value's gone down. He bought it in, 19, in 2008, you know, like, at the very end of the peak of the boom. And... Uh, and so he uh, overpaid a little bit for it, and now it's worth like um, $500,000 less. But last year, or no, like in April of this year, he filed a petition for, uh, to have his taxes reduced. And uh, he wrote on there that his house, he believes that the value of his house is only 200 and 200 and fifty dollars or something like that, two hundred fifty two dollars. I don't know where he gets this number from. So I called up the assessor today and 
and I asked her, what's going on here? You know, this guy's got a $1.6 million house that he thinks it's worth only $250. Is he, um, is that a typo? And she said, oh, no, uh uh-uh. This guy filed a petition for a review of his assessed value of his house, and, um, and he was, I think, she didn't say this, and she doesn't know, but I'm assuming that he did this out of, out of malice or spite that his card was delivered late. His assessed value card was delivered, well, I mean, I don't know what he means by late, because he got his appeal in on time. But, you know, I mean, that's what she said. I don't quite understand it. And she told me that since he had a professional company uh, uh, file his um, tax appeal, uh, that, that um, she asked, she said that he, the person who handles those kind of cases for the assessor might know a little bit more about it. So maybe um, next Monday I'll call him up. She gave me his name. His name is, last name is Sergeant. And her name was Denise. And, uh, you know, I don't know why I looked this up. I, I just was kind of curious, maybe. And, and I just, you know, re- went down at the bottom of the assessor's valuation page. And it says down there that he appealed the taxes on his property for 2015. And I looked up to see whether he continued to the State Board of Real Estate um, or State Board of Equalization about whether, you know, they weren't assessing it right and they he didn't um, file one because they would have had that hearing probably in July or, or so and the State Board of Equalization didn't have any. But, uh, you know, it's very strange, you know, this guy with a 1.6, well, it's worth... A million um, fifty-two thousand, I think now, and um, I think he's paying like six thousand a year or twelve thousand. I think it's twelve thousand a year in property tax, and he's saying to the assessor that he thinks the value of his house is only two hundred and fifty-six dollars and zero zero cents. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's zero zero because you know it wouldn't make any sense at all. I mean, why would why did he come up with that number, you know, and uh, why did he do this? It's like, he, according to her, she said that he mailed, he was upset that, or I, she didn't say upset, she just said that the basis of his appeal was that he ma- the, he, he received the card late. That's, that's all she said, and she didn't have any explanation more, but maybe this guy, Sergeant, who works for the uh, Pima County Assessor might know some more. So... Anyway, I guess I'll just go through these articles to show you how crazy things are, and then also how how serious this economic divide is between the rich and the poor. It's like uh, this is a letter to the editor, and I don't. There's I guess there's no title to it, but this person says uh, that CEO to worker compensation in 2013 was an outrageous 295.9 to 1, and then the ratio was about 40 to 1 in 1980, and of course, like, Ronald Reagan took over in 1980, as as far as I can remember, and, and like, he was the one who first bombed Muammar Gaddafi, and that's about the same time that I wrote this, this brochure here, because I mentioned, you know, about, about uh, Reagan bombing Gaddafi, and uh, there it is, the real reason Reagan hates Gaddafi. And it's sort of, it's the same thing with um, Hillary, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, and I think she is, you know, she's just as stupid and wicked as her, well, not wicked, but stupid as her husband, you know. Her husband was responsible for signing this uh, Commodity Futures Modernization Act, and um, in, in just before he uh, ran out, you know, his two terms as president in um, 1999, and um, so that uh, it deregulated these derivatives, and then um, these people, you know, this Wall Street money changer uh, monopoly game with all this funny money, this fiat money, is what's going to be, um, you know, it's like uh, musical chairs, you know, and 
and this serious problem with this global warming. You know, we're burning all this fossil fuel, and um, you know, the best thing that could happen to this planet would be an economic catastrophe. And you know, if these, you know, there are some elite people, you know, and and I think you know they're all aware. You know, Al Gore is aware, and it's too bad that he had to lose that election because there's no doubt in my mind that this 9/11 thing was was a, a, a setup and and um, they, you know, just like the Kennedy assassination, they set Lee Harvey Oswald up and uh, this 9-11, these buildings you can see, they were like pulverized and explosive. That's a, like a pyroclastic cloud. This heavy metal is ejected laterally and and then, you know, after that they got us involved in this, uh, you know, the Afghanistan thing and Here's building number seven. It was the third building in New York City that fell that day later in the afternoon. World Trade Center building number seven, and it comes straight down like a controlled demolition. So, like, you know, ever since uh, the CIA killed JFK in November 22nd, 1963, this country has been run basically by uh, people who, you know, Jimmy Carter is kind of a mystery, you know. Um, Nixon was in Dallas the the day that uh, or the the day before that Kennedy was assassinated and and of course George Bush senior was head of the CIA and but not at the same time but he worked for the CIA when Kennedy was assassinated and um <clears throat> Ronald Reagan was on the Rockefeller Commission in 1975 which examined these um photographs of E Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis who were caught behind the grassy knoll, and um, Ronald Reagan was on that committee, along with uh, uh, C. Douglas Dillon. It was like the rats investigating the mice, and um, his, you know, Nixon uh, or um, Hunt and Sturgis were anti-Castro, and uh, they were both Watergate burglars, and then uh, then uh, Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission, uh, and, you know, the past presidents. And uh, so, um, you know, this Clinton now, like, you know, it seems like, you know, J. Edgar Hoover was always trying to get dirty about people. You know, he'd try to blackmail or have something hanging over you so that you'll do their bidding. And, um, you know, Clinton uh, had this... <clears throat> um, drug trade going on and they'd fly the drugs from um, Nicaragua or whatever place down there I think to um, Mena, Arkansas and there's this movie I gotta see it it's about the, the drug trade it's a documentary and I'm I, sh I didn't bring this article in but I was really you know I'm always very interested in what m movies are going to be nominated for the Oscars in the documentary you, you know usually it's a Holocaust movie but this article was saying that documentaries don't do good at all in Hollywood. Nobody wants to see them anywhere. You know, it's not you can't sell it overseas most of the time. You know, unless it's about penguins or something. So we had a really bad choice of uh, documentaries. But you know, I mean, we we could use some. You know, like, like um, that um, um, Jim Garrison movie, uh, JFK by Oliver Stone, was pretty good, and. Um, like um, Bobby Kennedy, you know, he knew, you know, he he knew that his brother was uh, killed in a coup d'état, but he couldn't do anything about it until you know he became president, and um, so they had to get rid of him, and they uh, hypno programmed this guy Saran Saran. He was one of these people who was very susceptible to hypnosis, and Doctor Diamond, who examined him. He was like a prison physician or a psychiatrist, said that Saran Saran could be hypnotized at the snap of the fingers. And uh, they recovered a bunch of these diaries that he had, and he has this very cryptic, repetitive writing. And uh, it's kind of strange. It, uh, <clears throat> so they could have hypnoprogrammed him to shoot his gun off in the back room there and create a diversion. And so, like, they had this other person there who was a security guard who was, like, in the mafia. 
and he had a similar gun, a, a 22 caliber, um, and he was very close to Robert Kennedy, and there's evidence that the bullet wound that was like, there's powder burns on Robert Kennedy's neck and things, so that they could tell that the bullet was very close. And everybody that was there in the pantry when Robert Kennedy was assassinated said that that Saran Saran never got within three feet of of Kennedy. So the fatal shot wasn't by Robert or uh, by Saran Saran, but it was by this security guard. And there was a few prominent people. I think uh, Rosie Greer, the football player, was there <coughs> in the pantry, and. Uh, so Bobby Kennedy had some friends that <clears throat> would help um, investigate journalists and and you know Kennedy was Robert Kennedy was the attorney general and so he had a lot of legal friends and so they were following what this guy um, Jim Garrison was doing down in New Orleans during the um, um, trials they were trying to find out who who killed Kennedy and um, these guys that that Jim Garrison was going after ended up mysteriously dying. You know, there was a whole bunch of me pe people that mysteriously died, and uh, you really should see this. Um, Jim Garrison, he was the um, attorney general, or what do they call it? The uh, for I guess yeah, the uh, well yeah, attorney general for county attorney for. Um, New Orleans Parish and or the city, I don't know, one of the two, county, whatever they call it, you know, and so he was, you know, it was his jurisdiction and Lee Harvey Oswald was allegedly uh, training down there. Well, he wasn't allegedly, they know he was, they admitted he was down there uh, passing out or working anti-caste, no, he was pretending to be pro-Cuban pro and so they set him up, you know, they set up Lee Harvey Oswald to take the rap for um, killing Kennedy, you know, they told him bring a gun to the school book depository and um, get your fingerprints all over it, you know, and and um, say that it's curtain rods or something. And uh, that's the same thing they did with James Earl Ray. That James Earl Ray said, "Well, somebody told me to to um, to to bring this gun and deposit it over here." And so James Earl Ray quickly realized he was being set up. And that's the same thing with um, Lee Harvey Oswald. Apparently he figured, uh-oh, I'm being set up for the Kennedy assassination. And he ran home and got his gun, and and they say he killed this Officer Tippett who was chasing after him. And I think Officer Tippett was going to try to try to kill him on the spot and then claim that... Um, Lee Harvey Oswald pulled a gun on him, uh, or something. You know, they, eventually they shot him up. You know, Lee, uh, James, um, Jack Ruby ended up killing Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of the jail there. And Ruby was a, a known gangster. He was uh, a friends of Santos Traficante in Florida, and was involved in gun running. A lot of these people were involved in drug gun running, and that's the same thing that this Mena, Arkansas. And Bill Clinton were in on this cocaine for guns. It was, uh, you know, we had this thing just uh, recently down here, this where they were um, giving guns to these um, drug dealers, and and one of the drug dealers ended up shooting one of our um, border guards down here. You know, I'm telling you, these people are down there. They're just like soldiers, and you know, the police are just like soldiers. And I was being choked by um, one of the U of A police named, um, I just know his name was Officer Lovell, and he came into the library. I was reading a book on, I don't remember, the Kennedy assassination. It could have been any number of things. You know, I first moved to Tucson in January 1980, January 1st, and um, I've been here practically all the time since then, and uh, had some good times and bad times, but I ended up stuck here. And uh, so I'm in the library, homeless, you know, and uh, with a backpack, or I could have been living in my 1970 VW van. I, I don't remember, but like um, I was for a while doing that, and I lived at 3812 North Country Club, and it's kind of funny because 
my friend had to go to a doctor's appointment up there, and while she was in there, I took a walk down from uh, like First Avenue down to, uh, or no, from Campbell down to uh, Country Club, where um, you know I used to live, and they um, they bulldozed that whole area that used to be like. Uh, um, a house there, they bulldozed the house, and I could see where they filled in the swimming pool, and there was this nice Aleppo pine right on the Rolito River there, and uh, there was like a path down to the river, you know, it was the best place in Tucson, and I parked under this tree, and the neighbors loved me and everything, you know, and and uh, so I lived there and uh, rode my bicycle down to the university every day, and I think sometimes I even walked, you know, it was at least a at least a four mile walk each way. So, um, like last weekend or last week, I went um, to check out the old neighborhood where I used to live. You know, I even had a mailbox there, so I looked to see if the mailbox was still there. But this was, wow, way back in 1980, you know, and so I'm looking to see if that Aleppo Pine was there, and it wasn't. I wonder if there still is a 3812 North Country Club Road. And um, I remember the guy across the street was really nice to me. But, um, so, <clears throat> I'm in the library, and this officer of Lovell, he has me in a choke. And I remember he put his thumb into my mouth, <clears throat> and I uh, bit his thumb. And he just couldn't figure out how his thumb got injured, you know. It's like, oh, I got injured, and it's bleeding, you know. <laughs> and he didn't, I never confessed that I bit his thumb until now, in public at least. And uh, so, uh, I don't know if he got a tetanus shot or rabies or what, you know, but he he tried to kill me. <clears throat> well, he, he, he said, he's like, you know, choking me, and he's um, saying, I'm going to kill you. And I said, I started laughing, I think, and I says, you can't kill me. And he goes, why not? And I says, because it's not my time to die. And he such suddenly let me go. And, you know, so I know what it's like to have cops uh, harass me, and I've been like... When I was up, when I first, before I even came to Tucson, I was up at ASU and uh, in Tempe there. And this is going to be like the first time I'm going to Tempe to see my favorite band, Him, December 17th. And uh, so it'll be the first time I've been to Tempe since like, you know, um, January 79 or no, December 1979. And I'm at the, I don't know, maybe it wasn't December, but I do remember that I, when I was in Tempe, I got um, jumped by about three cops. I was harassing, not really harassing, I was just rationalizing or trying to talk sense into one of these Christian mall preachers. You know, and I'm telling them, oh, Jesus is dead, you know, and, uh, you know, you're uh, eating the blood and the drinking, eating the flesh of this, you know, it's like gross. You know, the sacrament is, oh, this is the blood of Christ and this is his body, you know, I mean, ugh, you know, this is morbid, crazy stuff. It's not logical. You know, I was telling you that Jesus is the logos or logic of God and uh, this stuff that St. Paul says and this stuff about, you know, the body of Christ, it's all nonsense. You know, Jesus was a radical, a revolutionary, and he told his disciples to go forth without money in their purses. And same with the Essenes, who were, like I said, contemporaries of Jesus. And this guy, Josephus, wrote about this Jewish war. And um, I think it started in 66 AD and went to like 68 AD. And the Jews started coining their own money. And uh, that was against the Roman law. And so in the Revelation, they said that um, no one buys or sells without the money of the beast. And the the number of the beast is 666, which is Nero Caesar, who was emperor at the time that the Jews revolted. So it all makes sense, but it's another one of those words they don't translate correctly. And um, so those cops at ASU, um, they came out, you know, there's a crowd of students watching me talk to this um, preacher, and suddenly out of nowhere, you know, they must have known who I was because, you know, back then I was talking about the Kennedy assassination. And, uh, you know, that was the first thing I ever really did. You know, I found out about that first. And, you know, when I really, you know, it, you know, the CIA killed JFK. You know, the, the Warren Commission report is a fraud. So I was, like, shocked. And um, 
and besides myself, and I didn't know what else to do but to, you know, you can't bury the truth under a bushel. It's like you gotta, like the prophet Jonah, you know, you've gotta um, prophesy against Babylon, or uh, you know, God's not gonna be happy. You know, I, you know, I, you know, people that are atheists, they just haven't experienced God, and I've had a lot of miracles and a lot of, and by miracles, I mean you might want to call them coincidences. But, I mean, these were very heavy educational experiences that, like I said, this, these cops at ASU jumped me and I smacked my head on the concrete and I had an out-of-body experience. I had, it was a classic, you know, like you see in the cartoons where the stars go around above your head and, and then I also surged off into the galaxy and I could see the light at the end of the tunnel and it was like bliss, you know, and... I, I said to myself, where am I, you know? And I said, this is bliss. And then I realized, oh man, you know, you just left your body. And so I came back down and I could see myself laying on the concrete. And I could hear people around saying, why did you have to do that? You know, these students were concerned. Why did you have to jump on me and bang my head on the concrete and knock me out and cause a concussion? And so I s said to myself, what condition is the body in? You know, my body and... You know, I, the only thing that really happened was I banged my head really, really hard on the concrete. And, you know, that's why when I see these videos like that baseball player, Rice, you know, with his throwing his girlfriend out the darn elevator with her head banging on the concrete. And then there's this really gross video of this girl who gets pushed, well, right here in Tucson, this cop push, pushed this girl right over, a white girl, over one of these benches that they use for the buses and things. And wow, man, you know, uh, she is so lucky she didn't bang her head like I did and, you know, end up going out of your body and all this stuff. And after that, you know, I had a, it was, you know, it caused a lot of peace. You know, it's like, wow, you know, I, I could have died and it was blissful. So, you know, that's, you know, and then I had this born again experience and, uh, uh, this person, it's kind of a long story, but I met another person here at Tucson that had the same experience. It's where you fall in love with somebody and you feel real insecure that they're going to leave. And so, like, um, this person did leave and I didn't have their phone number. You know, you know, we didn't have Facebook back then and there was no way for me to get a hold of this person and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I had one of these experiences of extreme insecurity and um, I self-hypnotized myself to feel like I was 12 years old and 6 years old. And then I entered into the womb and I said to myself, where am I, you know? And then I said to myself, oh, it's the womb, you know? And then I saw this flash of light and uh, I said, oh, God, it's, you know, it's God. I didn't say, oh, God, I just said, God, you know? And, uh, and then after that, I woke up and it was like, I didn't really wake up, I just snapped out of it, you know, and, and it was pouring rain out during this whole experience, and, uh, and then it was right here at 3812 North Country Club uh, where I was living in my van. I had this experience and it was pouring rain, and, and I woke up the next day and it was sunny and the Rolito River was flowing and there was sand in there, you know, and now they've, it's all full of these weeds and things, and uh, so uh, I immediately things were completely changed. You know, before that, I kind of walked around blindly. You know, they say, um, I don't know, how does that go? Where, Well, they, it was like I was uh, blind and now I could see. And, and But it wasn't nice, you know. It's like, how does it go? You, you um, First, you're blind and then you see and then you become blind again or something like that. You know, and the classical Greeks believed that blindness, it meant that you... Um, um, you know, there's a, it's a euphemism for, for um, oh God, what's what's that? The word is to flow, and I wrote about it somewhere here, and it means you know like the Greeks had some pretty good concepts with their words, you know like love. They had love eros, and then they had agape, and and so uh, the spirit is to breathe and things like that. And um, anyway, so um, 
Happy New Year. I'm going to be another year older, too. My birthday is coming up in a few days. I always keep it a secret so that nobody feels obliged. Anyway, I've got two different clocks. I think maybe I'm gone. Bye.